everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Economics, Principles, and Applications, 6th edition, by Robert Hall and Mark Lieberman. Today we're going to be doing Chapter 7, Problem Number 1. The problem states, The following table shows total output in tax returns completed per day of the accounting firm Hoodwink and Finagle. And then we're given number of accountants versus the number of returns per day like this here. And then it says, assuming the quantity of capital, computers, adding machines, desks, etc., remains constant at all output levels, and the amount of capital generally would stay constant at all output levels in the short run, because we say usually that in the long run we're flexible enough, we take a long enough planning horizon that we can adjust both the amount of capital and the amount of labor. But as a convention, we say a lot of the time that in the short run, or when we're taking a shorter planning horizon, essentially we've committed to you know, a size of factory or a particular amount of capital, and the only thing that we can move around in our cost equation is the amount of labor. Or the only thing we can move around in our production function is the amount of labor. So here, if we're only moving around the number of accountants, we're only changing the amount of labor, this is representative of a reasonably short run situation. So here we can say, calculate the marginal product of each accountant. So we can think about how to do that. And we have what's called the marginal product of labor, or in this case, the marginal product of each accountant. And we know that the marginal product of labor, call that MP sub L, mathematically is the change in quantity of output divided by the change in labor input. Intuitively, the marginal product of labor is just how much that last unit of labor contributed to output, or how much incremental output was produced because that last guy was added. Okay. So here we can go through and we can calculate this by just comparing both the number of accountants to the one before, and also the returns per day to the one before. Now we can't really do a marginal product of labor for zero accountants, not surprisingly because you can say how much, how much did the zeroth accountant add to output, that doesn't really make sense. So here you just put a line or not applicable or something like that. And then we could ask, what's the marginal product of this first accountant? And we would say, well that's just the change in quantity in going from the result of zero accountants to the result from one accountant divided by the change in the number of accountants, which you'll notice here, because these are all incrementing by one, we're always going to be dividing by one. That's not always going to be the case, so always be careful that you're not making that assumption when you're asked to calculate either marginal product, marginal cost, marginal really anything. But here we can see that this marginal product of labor of this first guy is just going to be 5 minus 0, or 5, divided by 1 minus 0, or 1. So it's just going to be 5 divided by 1, or 5. Similarly, we can keep doing that. And we can say that the marginal product of this second accountant, well, this second accountant brings us from an output level of 5 to an output level of 12. So his marginal product is going to be 12 minus 5, divided by 2 minus 1, or just 7 divided by 1, or 7. This third accountant brings us from 12 to 17 tax returns per day. So his marginal product is 17 minus 12 divided by 3 minus 2, or just 5 divided by 1, or 5. The marginal product of this fourth accountant here, well, he brought output from 17 to 20, so you probably see how we're going with this, right? So, but again, technically speaking, with this formula, we get 20 minus 17 divided by 4 minus 3, or just 3 divided by 1, or 3. And then this last guy, I was about to say last but not least, but I think he is both last and least, actually. This fifth guy brings us from an output of 20 to an output of 22. So, using this formula, we get 22 minus 20 divided by 5 minus 4, or just 2, two divided by 1. Or just two. 
So this is the list of marginal products that we see here. And notice in this case that I define the marginal product of labor just in the way that I drew this table as what this last guy adds to output. Sometimes when we talk about marginal quantities, for some reason it's defined as what the next guy adds to output, in which case you would have to shift all these numbers by one. So the five would go with the quantity of zero, the seven would go with the quantity of one, and so on and so forth. And to complicate matters even further, sometimes in order to try to clarify, but actually kind of makes things more complicated, we'll have the marginal product of labor, let's say in going from zero workers to one worker, we'll actually put it in the table sort of between those two rows so you'll get things being a little bit staggered in your table. In general, what you want to do is just be consistent with what you've seen in your class or what you see in your textbook. Part B of the question asks, over what range of employment do you see increasing returns to labor? And what range of output do you see diminishing returns to labor? You can also think of this, depending on terminology, some texts use diminishing marginal product of labor or increasing marginal product of labor. Same concept. So let's think about this here. So we have increasing returns or increasing marginal product of labor, not surprisingly, when our marginal product numbers are increasing. What that means intuitively is we have increasing returns to labor or increasing marginal product of labor when each worker is actually incrementally more useful than the one that came before. Conversely, we have diminishing marginal product of labor or decreasing returns to labor when we see these numbers, not surprisingly, decreasing. And intuitively what that means is when we have diminishing marginal product of labor or decreasing returns to labor, each incremental worker is not as useful as the one that came before. Okay, so you see that difference there? So here we could say over this range here, we had increasing returns to labor. So we saw increasing returns for a while, but then our numbers started getting smaller, and we saw decreasing returns to labor or diminishing marginal product of labor. So just go ahead and label that here. The last part of the question says, explain why the marginal product of labor might behave this way in the context of an accounting firm. So we can think about that here. And think about why, maybe for a while, we would get increasing returns to labor, and then we would get this turnaround here where we start getting decreasing returns to labor. So you can think about each part of this independently. Maybe when you have just this one guy, he's sort of running around and doing everything, and he can get a lot of stuff done because he has a lot of capital to work with, but he's not really able to focus his effort. He's not really able to specialize in any sort of way because he's running around doing everything. He's like answering the phones, he's preparing tax returns, He's opening the door for people and so on and so forth. And then you add the second guy, and that actually allows for some specialization, right? That rather than both of them haphazardly running around and doing everything, they can assign different tasks a little bit better than the, when there was just this one guy here. So for a while, maybe you get some organizational advantages and you see increasing returns to labor. It might also psychologically be the case that maybe people are like cats and they want to have a friend around. So just having this second guy around makes this first guy happier, makes him more productive. Who knows? It could also be that there's some sort of team production involved. And team production is the, those scenarios of production where the, the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. Like think about if your task was to lift heavy boxes and you were working by yourself, you wouldn't be able to be that productive. But if you added in a second worker and you worked as a team, all of a sudden those two workers together would produce more than two workers working separately would. So there are a number of explanations for why you might see this sort of behavior here. But then almost universally, we start seeing, eventually we start seeing decreasing returns to labor. And the reason for that is just as a reminder, think about what we were calculating here. We were calculating the change in quantity 
that resulted from adding one more worker holding everything else constant. So as we were going along here, we were adding more accountants, but we weren't adding more capital. We weren't adding more computers. We weren't adding more adding machines. I don't know who uses an, who uses an adding machine anymore, but you know. So think about what's happening. You know, these first guys come in and say we've chosen a level of like four computers. So this first guy comes in and that's fine. He has four computers to work with. He can run around, use all of them when he feels like it, use them for different purposes, whatever. But by the time we get down to this fifth guy here, we still only have four computers. So this fifth guy can really only use a computer when somebody else takes a smoke break or goes to the bathroom or whatever, right? So it's not surprising that when we hold the level of capital fixed, we eventually get decreasing returns or diminishing marginal product of labor because as we add more and more labor, each unit of labor has less capital to work with and it's therefore harder for that unit of labor to be as effective as the ones that came before.